All right, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And wrapping up one uh, final thought, also as a transition uh, into this, uh, some people wondered, questioned, well, after our Lord rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, what's Our Lady doing hanging around? I mean, she's kind of done, right? No. The same way the infant Jesus needed uh, taking care of, the infant church needed a mother as well. So our Lord left our Blessed Mother around for a short period to you know, help guide the church, just completely full of the Holy Spirit, uh, and was there, you know, being mom to the body of Christ, like she had been mom to his physical body <clears throat> here on earth. Uh, when uh, when our, uh, by the way, uh, I drink bang, and uh, it's liquid grace. Because <laughs> God doesn't have to operate just within the sacraments. <laughs> a fellow who owns bang, by the way, is a big Trump guy. Uh, that's not why I drink it, I like it. But anyway, <laughs> so our Blessed Mother uh, is nurturing the early church. So our Lord has two uh, uh, meetings, two sets of meetings with the apostles, who are, of course, the early church. He has two sets of meetings with them around the Passion, and he involves himself in two dialogues with them. Today we're going to talk about before Easter, and tomorrow, obviously Easter Sunday, we'll talk about his dialogue with them, dialogues with them, post-resurrection. But uh, I know a lot of people aren't particularly fond of, you know, uh, various documents, or at least the way they're worded at Vatican II, and their weirdness, and what does this mean exactly, and changes to the Mass and everything. But every now and then, every now and then, uh, you know, broken clock is right twice a day, the fourth Eucharistic prayer has a beautiful line in it, and it says, he always loved those who were his own in the world, and when the time came for him to be glorified by you as heavenly Father, he showed the depth of his love. While they were at supper, and go on at, uh, at Mass in the, uh, for the consecration, but after the Eucharist is instituted by our Lord and the priesthood, and Judas has betrayed him and gone out, our Lord now turns his attentions specifically to the apostles. And yesterday we covered his prayer to the Father, but before the prayer to his Father, which was about strengthening the apostles to carry on and be uh, the visible demonstration of a unity between first and second person in the third person, he goes through all of this verses, this big, giant, explanation, prophecy, uh, all of it, to the apostles there in the upper room. Now, at the moment they're hearing this, they have inside him, inside themselves, his body and blood. They've just received Holy Communion. And so he begins speaking to them from the wellspring, the depth of that love. And he tells them a number of things. One thing he says, tells them three things, two, three giant categories of things. The first thing he tells them about is hatred, that they will be hated because he was hated. And 
he mentions hate uh, in this particular thing, hate or hatred, uh, 11 different times. That's a lot. Talk about a hater. 11 different times. And they, it's not a question of being hated because of them. He directly ties it to because of him. You, are, you will be hated because I was hated. And because, look, lots of people are hated, right? I mean, lots of people hated Hitler. Being hated isn't a guarantee of anything unless the hatred is because of your relationship to our Lord. Then it is not only meritorious for you, but it's now explained. People hate the IRS. It certainly isn't because of its connection to anything divine. Quite the opposite, as a matter of fact. Um, So he has this discussion with them and says that because of all of this, I am in the Father. While he's having this conversation with them, he mentions the Father 45 times to try to stress to them the importance of the relationship between his father and him and how now they are going to be the extension of that. But because they are the extension of that, they're going to be, excuse me, they're going to be hated. Moreover, he then goes on to sort of explain the relationship between them and himself. And a very, very old, often used uh, understanding of Israel and God uh, was a vineyard or a vine. And this is that lovely discourse where our Lord says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Clusters can emerge on a branch. That's kind of the point of the branch. But they're not emerging on their own. They're happening because of the vine and the sap that is going through the vine to the branches. So our Lord begins to lay out the, this is what the church will be like down through the ages. I am the vine, you are the branches. He warns that some of the branches will have to be cut off. This is of his followers. This is in the world. This is his followers. Some of them will bear no fruit, and they have to be cut off and thrown into the fire. Once again, if you hear the von Balthasar slash barren idiocy, then no one goes to hell. Go to the particular discourse of our blessed Lord to his own apostles. One of them he has just sent out to go finish the work of his betrayal and goes to hell. And just in case anybody gets in their head, either sitting here or listening at home, uh, I don't have anything personally against Robert Barron. I've met him once in an elevator for maybe a minute, as in sense of been in his presence. Uh, I didn't like him, but it doesn't mean anything. I mean, I just thought he was kind of a jerk in the elevator. Uh, but that, that has nothing to do with any of this. Long before I ever laid eyes on him in 2018, I came across his claim that we have a reasonable hope all men are saved. And I went, uh-oh, that's the most dangerous thing anybody could say in the church. It gives a false, incorrect hope, and it must be corrected. So, I know lots of personalities and things get involved, and people are discussing this and that, and it's like, well, you don't like him. It has nothing to do with like. And it doesn't matter, like or not like. It has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with truth. Anybody who has a microphone in the Catholic world has a complete and total obligation to say the fullness of the truth period, no matter what it costs them and no matter how it's portrayed. You're hearing from my mouth 
anybody says anything different or anybody's watching at home, none of, it, none of the stuff I say has anything to do with anything personal. Most of the things and people and whatever we talk about, I've never met them. I don't need to meet them. I'm talking about what they say. I'm talking about what they propose for your salvation. And if somebody is taking you off the road, and I know differently, and you as well, we have an obligation to say the truth, period. And if people want to, you know, trivialize it into, oh, you don't like each other. Well, okay, fine. Then you just pretend we're sixth grade boys on the playground. But that's not what's going on. Barron is wrong about hell. And he's dangerously wrong because of the notion that that puts in people's minds. And he is anti-scriptural when he says the stuff he says. And I don't care if a bunch of other stuff or word on fire is cool and great and blah, 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 and he's got 200 zillion followers. He's wrong. So, and our Lord makes this point very clear. I'm going to cut off some of these branches. The branches that are going to be cut off bore no fruit. No clusters grew on them. Nothing happened. They were completely useless. Now, they are good for nothing except burning. And that had already begun. It had already begun right there in the upper room. Judas bolted out. He also talks about the branches that will produce fruit, will produce a bountiful cluster of grapes and all of this. There's a reason, he says, by their fruits you will know them. Everybody gets that, but that line goes back to this analogy of the vine. I am the vine, you are the branches. When he is talking to those who will be productive, produce fruit, good fruit, he says, you're going to need to be pruned, not as a chastisement, but so that you can be cut back so that you can produce even more fruit. There is a foreshadowing of the cross for them all right there. A cross on the sort of natural level, as we know, looking at it just naturally, sucks. Nobody likes a cross. It's the reason it's called a cross. Nobody likes it. If you ever have doubt in your mind that God exists, he's like, how come you never answer my prayers? Ask for a cross. <laughs> it gets answered in about three nanoseconds flat. So, uh, yeah, proof of God. God, please give me a cross. <laughs> oh, my tire just went flat. Uh, but this relationship, our Lord is explaining the relationship to, between them and him and what is going to happen to them. You're going to be hated. You're going to get crosses. But you will produce fruit. Some of you will produce much fruit, but you're all called to produce fruit, and if you don't, you get cast into hell. As our Lord progresses through Holy Week, he becomes more and more clear, less and less mysterious. And then he tells them, I'm going. I'm going away. You can't follow me. We already covered that part of this discourse with the apostles uh, when we talked about our Lord and Peter, their dialogue. And, you know, there's Peter, you know, what do you mean? I want to go. I go, go. I'll die for you. Ah, ah, ah. And our Lord's, uh, Peter, Ugh. rolled my eyes at you for three years and might as well do it the last night. And... I'm being facetious. Our Lord loved Pete, loved them all, loved Peter very, very much. Um, but it's here that he gives them the promise that 
In my Father's house there are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would not tell you. So, when we're thinking about our heavenly recompense, our heavenly reward, notice how our Lord casts it. He casts it as, remember, everybody here is poor. They're poor, you know, they're used to you know, dragging fish out of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, you know, the idea of a mansion would never have entered into their heads for themselves. They looked at the temple and thought it was tremendous, but nobody actually lived, at least in the inner sanctum of the temple. Nobody lived in the temple. And all of our Lord is painting this to them. Now, they're all upset. He's saying goodbye to them, and they're getting it. And you're like, well, what do you mean? You're going to the Father. What, what, what do you mean? What about us? In the apostle's mind there, he has to kind of blow up this idea that they had been walking around with, very similar to Judas, that there was going to be some sort of earthly kingdom, there was going to be some reestablishment of you know, the, the uh, kingdom of David, uh, that all of this was going, going to happen, that they were his, guys, you know, he'd said many things to them, he'd said many things to them, you will sit in judgment over the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, that's cool. That's really cool. I'll, I'll take Benjamin. No, I want Benjamin. So, all of this goodbye, what he is taking out of their minds at this Last Supper is any notion of that. Now, if you're saying, hey, we're going to establish a kingdom, this is what the apostles are really operating on for three years. That's why every time he said something to them, they're like, huh? And he's like, ugh. Even here at the Last Supper, you know, he's like, I'm going to the Father. And there's Philip saying, hey, all right, Master, are you going to show us the Father? And you can hear the, through his humanity, the sort of frustration of our Lord. And he says, Philip, have I been with you for three years and you still do not know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And to show the unity between Father and Son there, let, let's repeat this phrase, this utterance of our Lord, and actually ask whose voice is actually talking right here? So, Master, are you going to show us the Father? Philip, have I been with you three years, the son, and you still do not know who I am, the father? Anyone who has seen me has seen the father, the son. They both speak with the same voice because they are all three persons, God. Remember who's sitting there at the table. They see human Jesus, even though three of them had seen divine Jesus, you know, a few days before on the Mount of Transfiguration. They see human Jesus. They hear human Jesus' voice. Underneath that, hidden, is his divinity. But it's his divinity that is talking. It is the Godhead that is speaking, the fact that you have just added humanity to it doesn't change who the voice is from. It's the divine intellect speaking. That's how he's looking into the future and telling them everything that's going to happen to them. So he's clearing away, he's clearing away sort of as a last thing in a great big emotional moment here. He's getting rid of all of that. I'm about to be taken away and be killed. In a short while, you will see me no longer. Now, if you are around friends or family, loved ones, and you just 
love each other's company. You're always with each other. If you're not physically with each other, you're on the phone or FaceTiming or whatever the case is. You're around people that you love, you enjoy, you have fun with, you have serious moments with, consolation, all of it, all of it. And it just becomes like another part of you. And this is what the apostles have grown up around with our Lord. And all of a sudden, like a bolt of lightning, that's going to end tonight. Say that again? What do you mean? Where are you going? Why can't we come with you? This is all we've done for three years. We've laid on the desert and all slept together, a little band of 13 of us. We've eaten practically every meal together. We held the crowds at bay for you. We picked up every, all the leftover crumbs and everything. When you did all the loaves and fishes miracles, we sat there. You came over to us privately and explained what some of your parables meant. What do you mean you're going away? You never said this. You never said you were leaving us alone. You were just going to desert us. What's going on here? This is what would have been going through. And the gospel says, and Jesus saw how sad they were. This would have been a devastating moment for the apostles. In our Lord's humanity, it would have been just as devastating for him. He has the advantage, of course, of also having his divinity. So he's looking into the future. So to console them, because God is always about consolation, to console them, he uh, says, in a short while you will see me no longer, and then you will see me again. And that joy you have when you see me, no one will take from you. He's talking about the resurrection. Now, it's probably a reasonable assumption that while they heard that, because obviously they wrote it down, they remembered it, so they heard it, but, but when they first heard it, they're like, yeah, 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 but don't go. Just like all of us would be. Well, what, what, what do we, uh, yeah, great. Well, why do you have to, well, if you're going to come back in like an hour, why do you leave it all? So, our Lord does everything he can, and then he says to them in reference to the, uh, the example of uh, the, the vine and the branches, and which is the church, he has wiped away any kind of earthly kingdom notion. I'm leaving. I'm going to the Father. And he is instituting what the reality is. And they are going to have to simply trust him on this. That he's talking about something on a very deep level that he's only sort of touched on here and there before. And this becomes a, uh, a, a great moment of sadness for them because now there's confusion being added to it. Like, what are you talking about? I don't understand what you're talking about. That's why Philip blurts out that question. He has no idea what our Lord is talking about. Peter has no idea what our Lord is talking about here. Sadness, confusion, maybe even to some degree uh, hurt or feeling of abandonment, but certainly hurt, sadness, confusion, and our Lord points them to the future and says, I will not leave you orphans. I will come back to you. It's one of the most beautiful lines in all of sacred scripture. I will not leave you orphans. I will come back to you. And he did. And that's us too. Because right on the other side of that air wall, he's there. I will always be with you. What he said there in the upper room as he was going into his passion is essentially the exact same thing he said on the Mount of the Ascension as he was going to the Father. I will be with you all days. Now, 
because they had been around the post-ascension, the post-resurrection, I'm sorry, post-resurrection sightings and appearances and dealings and all that, they're a little bit better prepared now to understand it. They were not prepared to, for any of this in the upper room. Absolutely nothing. Every single thing they say to him bespeaks hurt, confusion, sadness, everything. And uh, our Lord feels that. Uh, he makes it clear, but he's always looking, taking them to the future. You have to trust me. So, to show you how, as an example, many examples of how sort of superficial the intellectual faith of the apostles was at the time versus their uh, realized faith after the resurrection. Remember, it was all about you know, having an earthly kingdom. It was all the Davidic kingdom. We're going to be, you know, hot stuff. We're in charge. This is great. We're friends with the king. You're not. James and John's mother. You know, what mom, what mom in this room wouldn't do that same thing? Hey, Jesus. You know, I, I, all the other boys are very nice. I think they deserve all sorts of stuff. They really do. They're very nice. They're very nice with my boys. But uh, my boys, let's, can we talk? It'd be really good if they could sit at your right and left hand because, you know, they, you know, I've known them forever. They're really good. They're, it's not just anything bad about the other mothers and their boys, but my boys, the others, not so much. <laughs> and that lady, that mom, is one of them standing at the foot of the cross. Only one person understood what was going on this entire time, and it was Our Lady. No one else had the slightest clue. But their love brought them to this point. Who is this guy? What's going on? Who is that? You hear them in the Gospels. You know, who is this? He commands the sea and the waves. He raises people from the dead. I think one of the most hysterical lines in all of sacred scripture is after our Lord has transfigured and God the Father, hidden by a cloud, comes over them on the Mount of Transfiguration. And, you know, this is my beloved Son. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him, you three. And they're terrified, says so. They look up, they see Jesus, they're walking down the mountain, and our Lord it says, strictly instructs them to tell no one of what they had seen until he had been risen from the dead. You could end it there, but in sort of a salute to the, uh, shall we just say, the intellectual deprivation of the apostles at that point, it goes on to say, and they discussed quietly amongst themselves what risen from the dead meant. They had just watched Lazarus come out of the tomb the day before. So this is not like the Mensa Society. <laughs> I can say that because I'm talking about them before the resurrection. <laughs> so this is the crowd that they love him. They don't get his message, they feel compelled because they're men of goodwill, however intellectually in turmoil they are, or confusion, and in and out of it, and they've got some ambition in there, and I want to be here, and I'm sitting at your right hand, and what about me, and, you know, he's nice, but, you know, I deserve that, and, you know, an argument breaks out amongst them, remember, before 
the Eucharist, before our Lord institutes the Eucharist. He gets up there, and they're all like, they're having this big argument about who's the most important. And that's just a very short time before he sets them straight, washes their feet, stands up and says, you know, be humble, essentially. Be humble. Institutes the Eucharist, has his little deal with Judas. Judas bolts, and then here they are. And now he's like, oh, I'm out of here. What? They don't understand anything. They don't have an intellectual grasp of what's going on. They've substituted it with their kind of own ambitions and their confusion. But as are most of us in our spiritual lives, they are a mixed bag. There's some stuff in there that needs to be cut away from the vine, from the branch, so that more sap, which is the life of Christ, can get into our branch. And they need it just as we all do. So, I mean, is that sacramentally, is that not what happens in confession? What do you got to go do in confession? You got to sit down or kneel down uh, and come to terms with yourself in a mirror. It's humiliating, provided you make a good confession. It's humiliating. You have to admit the truth of whatever it is. If it's habitual sin, you got to get over the frustration of it. I don't mean get over it like not care about it. I mean conquer it. But there's frustration in that. Uh, you, I think you'd be hard-pressed to ask any faithful believing Catholic, or for that fact, any priest who hears confessions, you know, what, what do you hear? I hear the same things over and over and over and over. And if we ask ourselves, we'll say, that's because we go in and say the same things over and over and over. Even the process of the reception of the sacrament of confession is a pruning away. It has to be. You get a sort of cut away that little twig there that's not doing anything. As a matter of fact, it's drawing some of the sap from it, but it's not producing anything with it. Chop it off. Get rid of it. This is what our Lord's saying. He then goes on to talk to them not just about the joy they will experience from uh, seeing him again, but the joy they will have by being united to him as the branch to the vine. That the life of God that flows through, he's talking about a state of grace, sanctifying grace. The life of God that flows through someone brings joy. It brings an inner joy. Not that saccharine, you know, stuff in the church of nice. Where he's like, hi, how's your day going? Are you moved by the Holy Spirit? I am too. Get away. <laughs> That's not the joy he's speaking about. Um, the Holy Spirit placed onto my heart. Y you don't know that. You have no idea if that's the case or not. If you have assurance that the Holy Spirit placed onto your heart whatever it is you're saying, well, how are you going to respond when I tell you the Holy Spirit placed onto my heart that you're weird? <laughs> and actually what you're saying isn't rooted in anything. Big Catholic warning. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. That the Holy Spirit is a Protestant thing. Because it's all up to interpretation. The Lord placed onto my heart. That might have been the onion rings you had at lunch, but you don't know that. You live in a state of grace as a moral choice comes onto your radar you respond 
from a state of grace. You respond in a Christ-like fashion to whatever it is. Now, I'm not discounting the idea of inspiration or anything like that. Of course I'm not discounting that. But you will find that the more people walk around and tell you the ruminations of the Holy Spirit as they have been revealed privately to them, the less and less accurate they actually are. That's a very, very bad reading of sacred scripture. And don't fall for it. And you hear it all the time in the church of nice. Be very, very careful of, first of all, giving way to that yourselves, and secondly, just hearing somebody say it. So, little Will Robinson danger alert going off there. The joy that our Lord is speaking of is the certitude of your reward. It's the only thing that can make you carry the cross. The very people he's saying this to, the men around that table at the Last Supper, will, in very short order, within a few months, be dragged in front of the same Sanhedrin that our Lord was, and accused of this, and told to stop saying things in that man's name, and this and that and everything, and their response is what he's talking about. And they left full of joy because they had to suffer because of him. That's not, hi, I'm the Holy Holy Spirit told me today. That's phony. It's superficial. God's love is never superficial. To carry God's love around in you and know the joy that the future holds for you gives you a foretaste of that joy in this life. Just like people who live in evil and will for all eternity have a foretaste of it in this life as well. Heaven and hell begin on this earth. They merely come to their fullness in the next life. You just sort of morph into the eternity that you have prepared for yourself. You've made your bed, walked around, done it however you're going to do it, and when it comes to be bedtime, you get into the bed you've made. So the joy is a prelude to heavenly joy, and it gives you the strength to get through deaths of loved ones, uh, horrible medical whatever may be going on, uh, you know, the crushing heartache of betrayal, uh, all of the crosses that come our way in this life. Many people experience those crosses, they get those crosses, and they kill themselves. They see no point in the suffering. They see no, nothing to the uh, power of redemption. They see just the cross, and they can't get past the cross to a few feet away, there's an empty tomb. They fixate so much on the cross and the pain and the suffering and everything that goes along with it that they have no joy. It's just the cross. Even for our Lord, it was not just the cross. He never, ever, ever, ever spoke about the cross without also bringing in the glory of the resurrection. At the Last Supper, every single time he preached, whenever he gave the warning about what was going to happen to him, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'll be, you know, uh, handed over 
by the chief priests and the elders, the Son of Man will be crucified, put to death, and on the third day, rise again. He always completed the story. That is the great Catholic vision. This is why the putting a cross in a sanctuary is absurd. You put a crucifix in a sanctuary. Putting a resurrexifix in a sanctuary is insulting to Catholic sensibilities. You have to accept the cross so that you may experience the resurrection. As Bishop Sheen said, there can be no Easter Sunday without first a Good Friday. But the reverse of that is true. If you endure the Good Friday, you will have the Easter Sunday. And no one will be able to take that joy from you. So that joy, that knowledge, that knowledge has to seep down through our intellects into our hearts and flood out through our wills. Just as the apostles sat there in the upper room saying, Jesus, why? I don't, why? Why? Those same apostles went on to suffer horrible deaths, horrible deaths, boiled in oil, skin flayed off them, crucified upside down, just every, you know, everything, because they loved and were anticipating the joy that they were very shortly going to receive and that no one would take away from them. And they began to experience it on this earth. That's how they were able to be martyred. And the very last thing our Lord tells them about is the Spirit. That all of this will be accomplished by the Spirit, the Spirit of my Father and me. I will go away and I will send you your advocate, your paraclete, the comforter. And he will remind you of everything I told you and lead you to all truth. Our Lord didn't say everything while he was on earth. He didn't say most of it. He even said in that dinner, I have many things to tell you right now, but you cannot bear them all. And when I have left, I will send you the Comforter, and he will reveal to you all truths, and he will remind you of what I had said to you. That right there is the, is the development of the church, the kernel of it, of what's being said and taught and everything that's necessary is right there present in our Lord. But his work gets carried on through his mystical body, enlivened, vivified by the Holy Spirit. And because we're talking about the Holy Spirit and we're talking about mission and uh, being disciples and having a command, I'd like you to all write down this prayer. It's very, very short. And I will simply counsel you, don't pray this until you're ready to pray it. And when you're ready to pray it, go ahead and uh, step back. <laughs> the prayer is, Holy Spirit, command me to do your will. That's it. Cast all your cares on him. Our Lord called him the comforter. Cast all your cares on him. Make your prayer. God will not refuse to answer that prayer. 
It is perfectly in accord with the divine will. Command me to do your will. Use me, each of us, to save souls. Perfectly in accord with the divine will. God will not refuse that prayer. He will rush to answer that prayer. But as usual, with all things divine, it comes with a footnote. And that footnote is, when you pray that prayer in sincerity, prepare for everything in your life to change. Some of it will be painful. You have to tear away from some things. Whatever it is, whatever it is, when you say, use me, use me, command me to do your will, okay, you said it, so don't pray it until you're ready. How will you know you're ready? Well, heck, you can ask that prayer. Hey, I'd like to pray this prayer, but not right now. St. Augustine, make me chaste, just not yet. I'm having a little bit too much fun right now. I get it, but same thing here. I want to pray this prayer. I, uh, why don't you just let me know when I should pray it? Well, that's a prayer. That works. No one will take your joy from you. That's the final message, and then after, to them. That's the last message of our Lord to the apostles in the upper room, and then he goes out and is slaughtered in front of their eyes, and they lose faith. And tomorrow is Easter Sunday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.